Travis Hunter looks like an immediate two-way impact player. Other takeaways from the Jackson State spring game, and we have some under-the-radar HBCU players to watch in this year's draft. Oh, yeah, it's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day and i hope that you went on this journey with jackson state on sunday watching their spring game because let me tell you if you didn't come away from there saying that travis hunter is going to be an immediate two-way impact player we wasn't watching the same game we weren't this guy lived up to all of the hype listen not only has has travis hunter arrived travis hunter is a star he is And I'm trying not to feed into the hype and and give him time to grow. But listen, it doesn't look like he needs time to grow right now. He will grow into his stardom. I believe that. But there's no question if he's going to be a star now. I, I Look, Hunter was so good on both sides of the ball that if you only showed his highlight, you would think it was a pretty even matchup between Jackson State's offense and defense. That's just how good he was. Let me say that again. Travis Hunter was so good on both sides of the ball that if you only showed his highlights, you would think that Jackson State's offense and defense were equals. Y'all got to hear me. Y'all got to hear me because this guy came out there and stole the show. He was absolutely fantastic in his debut. And listen, I understand that his debut was highly anticipated number one recruit in the nation, going to an FCS school, never happened before, going to an HBCU, never happened before. Everybody wants to know, what is this guy going to look like? I've seen him in a couple of practices, especially one clip where he had caught the ball and he threw it, and he was yelling at it. He was giving the offense the business, like, man, why are you even trying this on me? Why are you even trying this on me? Let's remember that he said that. He didn't say, why are you? He said, don't try this on me again. He issued a warning. He said, do not try this on me again. And that's when he was playing cornerback. But, you know, I want to see what it's going to be like. And I understand that the spring game is essentially just a practice. Whatever. And I understand he was going against the twos for the most part of this, but he picked off Shador. Shador isn't a two. Shador is the starting quarterback. Jerry Rice Award winner last year. Mind you, I understand it's still practice, but get it i comprehend it i understand that maybe i shouldn't be so hype about practice but emotion and logic are mortal enemies they don't they just don't get along they don't they don't stand toe to toe they don't stand side by side they never come together they never do they're always at war so i can understand that it's a practice and i probably shouldn't get this hype about four really good plays that i saw in a practice but if you saw them plays you understand where i'm coming from you do Let's get into it because this told me a couple of things as far as what he's going to be, what they feel he is, what he has the ability to be. And my my expectations is that he's going to be an immediate two-way player for Jackson State, impact two-way player. Now, is that a lot of expectations to place upon a young man who has never actually taken a collegiate snap? Yeah. I think it is. However, at the same time, let's not forget he is the number one recruit in the nation coming out of this class. Number two, depending on who you're talking to, right? Because everybody has different metrics or whatnot. You're a top two player in the class. Your shoulders are broad. You're meant to be able to carry and hold these expectations. You're meant for that. It's like being a number one pick. Yeah, we're going to put a whole lot of expectations on you, but you're expected to know how to carry it and still make it look good. 
So I'm placing these expectations on him, but I think that he can truly beat that. And I don't place these expectations strictly because he was the number one uh, recruit in the nation. I placed them on him because I just watched him. See, coming into the game, there was a question of, should Travis Hunter play offense? I don't know. He's a pretty good defender. He's a really good defender. You know, he's the number one cornerback in the nation. I would understand completely just saying, hey, we're going to focus on that. I remember Derek Stingley at LSU. They wanted him to play both ways, but they said, we're going to make sure that you're a top flight corner first. And then as time goes on, we're going to make you a wide receiver too sometimes. So when the game first starts, the question of would Travis Hunter play offense was answered immediately. They gave him an end around. And on that first touch, that end around, the answer of should Travis Hunter play offense was also answered. And both of those were yeses. Would he play offense? Yeah, he got the first snap. And on the first snap, they gave him an end around. It was a 25-yard gain, and he didn't have to do anything too special. He just had to show that he understood how to move on the field. He just had to make sure that it was clear that when the ball's in my hand, I'm comfortable. In a way, he kind of felt like prime. And I'm not saying he's Deion Sanders, because Deion Sanders is top five, arguably greatest players to ever live. So, and some would say he's the best, right? So I'm not saying he's Deion Sanders, but... Deion Sanders-esque. You understand where the comparisons come from. And on his second touch, on that second touch, it was a touchdown pass. And it wasn't just a, a wide open touchdown. It wasn't anything like that. It was a play where, yeah, he had a really good break to where he got a lot of room and a lot of separation on the defender on a corner route. But the, the, the defender recovered. He got into a decent place. And Hunter, uh, excuse me, Hunter high pointed the ball and it came down through the contact. Now, this, he looks like a receiver. He does. I think it was the next offensive possession. If it wasn't the next, it was one of the uh, next two. He caught a bomb. This one was wide open. He had blue pass. It wasn't a defender in sight. There's really no analytical breakdown there. He was just ahead of everybody. And he continued to be ahead of everybody until he hit the white line. And even when he was jogging, he still, he still had enough room to be ahead of everybody. Now you flip over to the defensive side of the ball. He had two interceptions. I just told you he had two touchdowns. He had two interceptions as well. Now, the first interception was, I would have thought he was the target because he was running step for step with the wide receiver. I, I wasn't so sure that he didn't run into the huddle here to play because, mind you, he had both jerseys. So he had a white jersey and he had a navy jersey. So maybe he just said, you know, I'm going to throw my white jersey on real quick, make him think I don't know the play, throw my blue jersey back on, and then I'm going to come and run, and run this route for the wide receiver because that's how good that he was in that coverage. He was sticky, man. And then in the second one, this was the one that was on Shadour. Remember I told you a lot of his on twos, if you want to say whatever. Mm -mm. He showed traits to where I'm like, okay, I got to see what this guy is going to be. He showed me those traits. And then on the defensive side of the ball, he did it against the one. He did it against Shadour. Remember when I told you, he said, why, why are you trying me with that? Don't, or don't try me with that. He issued the warning. When he picked off Shadour Sanders, Deion said, I don't know why Shadour tried him. That's what Dion said when he was getting interviewed in the midst of that play happening. He then said, okay, I could see what he thought was happening. I, I, I could see what he think was going to happen as far as throwing that ball. But Travis Hunter was just so good. He showed an understanding of baiting. He was in trail position. He undercut the receiver at the perfect time. Made Shador think that, oh, okay, well, he got beat and then undercut the pass. You know, it was more so of an outsmarting Shador on that, on that uh, interception as far as the first one was just like, man, I'm the wide receiver. I'm, 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 I might be the cornerback. I might have this blue jersey on, but I'm the wide receiver because that's how good I ran this route for the guy. And that's two touchdowns. That's two. That's two interceptions. So when I tell you that, if if you ran a, just a highlight tape of Travis Hunter for this game, you would think that it was even on both sides as far as offense versus defense. If you didn't know that both guys were Travis Hunter, that's what you would think because that's how good and that's how impactful that he was in the game and. He's going to be a cornerback because during the game, he bumped knees. I think everybody expected him to be a corner. Now, those wide receiver routes that he was running, and as far as how effective he was as a wide receiver, he looked enough to be a wide receiver. But everybody knows he's a cornerback first and foremost. He bumped knees in the game, and they took him off of offense. They didn't take him out of the game. They took him off of offense. So there's no more question of, is he going to play offense? Should he play offense? This game emphatically told you yes. He should and will play offense. The only question now is how much offense is he going to play? 
There ain't no question though. Travis Hunter is a two-way immediate impact player, and he had a debut that is going to be ringing for weeks to come. People are going to continue talking about, oh, that guy's a star, and we see why he was the number one recruit in the nation. If we hadn't been able to see him before, we now understand it. But going forward, we're not done with Jackson State. We're still going to sit here and we're still going to talk about what other takeaways came from the game because it wasn't just Travis Hunter. Travis Hunter wasn't the only person that played in that game. There was some other takeaways as far as positive and some things that was a little bit negative as well. But first, I want to tell you about Athletic Greens because Athletic Greens has made its way into my daily routine. I take it either right before I eat breakfast or right after. I just have to get it done in the beginning of the day because I need myself something that's going to make my body feel like a well oiled machine. And that's why I got it. I wanted something that was going to improve my gut health. I got that. What I didn't expect was to get something that tasted just as good as Athletic Greens does. And with just one scoop, just a singular scoop, just a scoop of something to drink it down with, I'm getting 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, and probiotics. It's amazing. And listen, <laughs> I'm not the only person who feels this way. There's 7,000 people and growing that believe that Athletic Greens is great, gave it a five-star review, and it's not going to break the bank for you. Now, if you go to athleticgreen.com slash college and you, you know, just go there and buy there, they'll give you five free travel packs with your first purchase and a free year supply of immune supporting, supporting vitamin D. I'm helping you get something free along with helping your body. It seems like an easy decision to me. All right, so keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day every day. And we want to make sure that you're checking out the Locked on NFL Draft show starting on Thursday. It's only a couple of days away. We're right here. Make sure that you're checking out all the live coverage rounds one through seven days, one through three. There's not going to be a minute or a pick that the Locked on crew is not going to be there for. Now, Jackson State had many other takeaways that aren't Travis Hunter. And I want to provide you with three of my biggest takeaways. Now, today, oh, my bad, before I get too far, today's word of the day is hoary. It means so old or so familiar as to be dull. All right. So before I get into all of this, Travis Hunter was a big takeaway. It was the biggest takeaway. It was one of the things that we're going to be looking for. But this is something that might have been equally as important for the for the vitality of this team now travis hunter is great for highlights he's great for tweets and instagram and all of those things and he's great for winning games as well but he's not going to win them alone he's not he's not and it's something that we're going to talk about it's a great talking point but something we don't want to talk about is the fact that the offensive line of jackson state is still poor it's still it's still not something that they're happy with and this isn't just me you know, jumping down a throat. This is Deion Sanders who was yelling. Coach Prime was yelling the whole time, like, got to get this together, got to get this together, got to get this together. And I think that on the inverse of it, you could say that the defensive line was good. That would definitely be the more probably optimistic way of putting it. This may seem a tad bit pessimistic, and I'm not trying to take any credit away from them because it could just be that they're good. And, and time will tell as far as, how much of this is defensive line just being better than the offensive line. And I will never say that they're not good. But what I will say is the focus of this takeaway is going to be the offensive line because the focus of the offseason was the offensive line. We didn't sit around here talking about the defensive line as much. What we did sit around here and say is that Shador Sanders was rattled in the celebration bowl. I personally feel like we even talked about it with the on the SWAC championship game. We talked about it on this platform, at least. I don't know about nationally. I know more people started talking about it with the Celebration Bowl, but I saw it in the, in the SWAC championship. There was a lack of protection, and it caused him to be jittery. It caused him to not look as good as I've seen him look earlier in the season. These things happen, it, but they need to be fixed going into the next year, especially because you didn't win the Celebration Bowl, so it's no more getting complacent, like, oh, yeah, we could just do it again. Nah, you got to fix that offensive line. They came in with a plan to do it. But as of right now, it does not look like that plan is – executing properly you look at the center and the center got yanked twice for bad snaps he had four bad snaps in the first three series that i counted here's the thing as opposed as opposed to all the other lineman positions a bad snap from your center can crush the play before you even get started 
And I don't just mean like, oh, man, Aaron Donald's coming through on you. No, I mean, if you snap the ball over my head, the play's over. I'm doing everything I can to scramble and grab the ball, and maybe if it's a pass play, I can scramble out and throw it away. If it's a run play, I'm done for. If you snap it too far to the right, too too far to the left, well, now everything is out of sync. And you almost saw that happen on the first play of the game where he snapped it low and right, and you're trying to get the fake in and then also get the end around it. And maybe if it wasn't an end around coming because you could be a little bit more lack, lack, uh, excuse me, lackadaisical on that, on that fake because, hey, man, like, it's not going there anyway. You'd want to actually try to act like you're going to put it in his pocket, but you couldn't because the snap was bad, but you're, in, you're ending up flipping it out anyway, so it didn't matter. You had a long developing play that you just had to pitch out late, so maybe it didn't impact as much on that. But a bad snap, you you out of luck. You are. And the rest of the offensive line wasn't that great either. They they came in trying to, trying to build on the O-line, trying to bolster it and make it better. It just didn't look that way on Sunday. It could look that way for the Saturdays throughout the rest of the season. But as far as last Sunday, it just didn't look that way. Offensive line was getting penetrated as far as right up the middle. Pass rushes were coming around the edge. They had a couple of plays that was negated. One specifically that jumps to mind was a pass on third and long that actually looked like it would have got the first down. But because, well, the edge rusher came around the corner, didn't count. And he caught the ball, everything. Everything so, and he had room to run. Kevin Coleman had room to run with the ball, and I think that if he didn't catch it at the sticks or beyond the sticks, he had room to get past it. It was that far down the field that he caught it, and he had that much room as well, but it didn't count because he would have been sacked. So in a third and long situation when you have an open receiver that could have been hit, you got a sack. Boom. These type of things are going to slow the offense, and then also you want to establish the run, but you can't establish any force up front. That just doesn't go together. You can desire that all you want, but if you don't have that offensive line, and this isn't saying anything as far as trying to inform Deion Sanders, Coach Prime said this already. He was saying it during the game that they want to in- enforce the run, but they can't because the offensive line isn't doing what they want to do. It leads to a predictable offense. This offensive line, if it doesn't get better, this could be a reason that Jackson State does not repeat. It's really that serious. And I wanted to talk about it because – Let's get the negative out the way first, and now we can get into the positive. And that's that they have wide receiver depth. And you're going to be trying to replace Kevin Coleman. And Travis Hunter, it's not Kevin Coleman, Keith Corbin, excuse me, KC and KC. But Travis Hunter looks like he can play wide receiver. He's probably not going to play that much of wide receiver, but he can definitely play it. But they don't need him to. They don't. They have depth. They have people coming back from last year. They lost Keith Corbin. And... He um he might have been a guy who went over the middle, and I thought that was something good that the broadcast has pointed out, is that, yeah, he went over the middle a lot. And that's something that he did really well for this team as far as being somebody who patrols the middle and did things of that nature. They don't have that. They have vertical guys as far as Rucker and, and Weidman. Those are vertical guys. Somebody who stood out to me was stud still. And I think those guys are all capable of being a wide receiver one, but we're talking about specific roles that Keith Corbin did, not talking about just the slot that he was as far as, oh, you're wide receiver one. Who's going to be the, the top dog on the team? No, who's going to go over the middle? I didn't see that much. I did see it from Kevin Coleman one time, so maybe he's going to be that guy. And oh, while we're here, let's brag on Kevin Coleman because right after Travis Hunter had his first touchdown, Kevin Coleman said, don't forget, this, this, this recruiting class is not just Travis Hunter. It's also me. It's also me. So he came back and said, you know what? I'm going to return this kickoff all the way to the house. They end up starting it over because they wanted the offense to have a drive. But he returned that kickoff all the way to the touchdown. He, 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 he looked like an impact player. And if you can be a, a kickoff returner immediately, you're already going to have a role. And you have immediate impact players as freshmen. That's a good recruiting class. And recruiting is the other takeaway that I have. Recruiting never stops. And they're still just getting bigger and bigger. They have an offensive lineman out of Louisiana Lafayette coming over. And we see there's a spot for him somewhere. We'll see where he can slide in. But there's a spot somewhere in there that everybody should not be secure. If he can come in, it still looks like that offensive line can be improved, can be bolstered. So we'll see if he plays or not. Once again, these players can't get better. It's not that they're just garbage. Like, oh, then throw them away. They're no good. No, they had a bad practice. I don't know what they've been like the whole four weeks of practice or whatnot. But... They've been pretty good as far as that goes. Now, as we continue going forward, I think, oh, my bad. And they also got a four-star recruit who has some Power 5 offers. And 
They just continue racking them up. Jackson State is doing the thing, man. They're doing the thing. And as we go forward, we're going to be talking about our under-the-radar prospects that we truly need to watch for. And I already told you, I got a guy in Keyshawn James that, in my opinion, needs to be talked about on a regular basis. But first, let me tell you about Bet Online before we do any of that, because Bet Online is the best place for all of your sports wagering. You have the NBA playoffs going on right now. Get you a couple of days to really focus on that. But we know football is king, baby. And the NFL draft is coming up. You're going to have a lot of odds there. In the first round, is there going to be over under 16 and a half offensive players drafted? Over under 15 and a half defensive players drafted. How many wide receivers, or excuse me, in the first round for both of those? How many wide receivers are going to go in the first round? You're going to have odds and props like that. In the in the uh in the in the NBA playoffs, there should have been a, a, a prop that said, is Ben Simmons going to play? Yes or no. I would have taken the I ain't gonna lie, I would have taken the yes. Because for some reason I got duped again. But for some reason, I would have taken a yes. We have odds. We need odds like that. But there are going to be odds as far as who's going to score this much, who's going to win this game, what are the spreads, everything that you need for the NFL draft, for the NBA playoffs. BetOnline.net is your destination for it because they are the fastest and easiest. Where to wage on all of your favorite sports. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, as we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, we're going to be talking about our under-the-radar HBCU prospects, and I want to kick it off by telling you somebody who isn't on the list, and that's Will Adams, and it's no disrespect to him. I just don't think Will Adams is under the radar anymore. I'm not trying to sit here and say, oh, these guys are better than da 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 I just don't think he is. I, I mean, after his HBCU combine, he started to have his name buzzing more and more, but now I hear him talked about on the national scale. I mean, when you have the measurements in, in the – the jumps that he had at the HBCU combine, this is somebody that you're going to talk about. He's earned it, but he's also earned his way out of the under uh, the radar. You know, it's like when the guy gets all of this praise, he's no longer underrated. He isn't, you know, it's things like that. So it's no disrespect to him. I remember earlier in the week, I was like, I don't know if he's under the radar or not. Well, I decided that he isn't. And I just want to say that because I did pose the question earlier in the year, but who, we get to get to that guy, my guy that I've been wanting to talk about. I wasn't going to sit here and tell you, oh, we got to build up the anticipation. We got to do this, that, and the third. No, screw that. I want to jump straight into it, and I want to talk about Keyshawn James, a mammoth of a man, standing about 6'4", 280. Oh, he's a force inside. He is. Man, I really enjoy this player. This is my favorite under-the-radar player. and. I think I found him shortly before the HBCU Combine. When I saw the way that he moved at the HBCU Combine, I said, yep, I like him. I like him. He he moved well for a guy of his size. And let's put this in perspective because he's teammates with Joshua Williams. Joshua Williams will be and deserves to be a top three HBCU player off the board. I completely understand that. They played on the same team, and Keyshawn James was still the CIAA Defensive Player of the Year. He wasn't the team MVP. He was the Defensive Player of the Year of the conference. And that's no slight to Joshua Williams. He deserves all the credit he is. So let's understand where Josh Williams is, where people have been placing him. We understand that he is that good. This don't bring him down. This only brings James up. I really like him, and he's gotten better every year. He's yet to peak. If you continue to get better every year of your collegiate career, you didn't peak. Now, here are the stats, and I'm talking about disruption. Let's just go from freshman to senior year. Tackles for a loss go from 8.5, 12.5, 16.5, 23.5. That's ridiculous. 23.5 is ridiculous. Sacks go from 1.5 to 8 to 9.5 to 10.5, consistently going up. You see those disruption stats continuously going up. In addition to all of that, he had four forced fumbles in the last two years, both. Not combined, four, four la he had four last year and four the year before that. I really do enjoy his game, and I could probably sit here and go on forever talking about Keyshawn James. He could have been his own segment, but I wanted to get more players in here. And Next up, Afshamar Bridges, a friend of the show. He's been on the show before, and he's always talking about how he wants to defy the big guy stereotypes, and I think that he does. He's he's fast. He's twitchy. He's not stiff. Those are things that he says, look, people look at big guys and think that we might be stiff, stiff runners, stiff movers. I'm not that. 
And while Bridges does break down a lot of the stereotypes of what a big man can't do, he doesn't break away from the stereotypes of what a big man can do, and that's use his size. He does a really good job using his size and saying, okay, I understand when I need to be twitchy, I understand that, but I also understand when I need to just body somebody. I just need to box out. I need to do those things. I get that. And, you know, he and, and the thing that impresses me the most is the fact that he's a hands catcher. Good hands. He's not bringing it into his body. He's not catching it right here in this little area right here. He's catching it right here with his hands, okay? And that's what I appreciate because you know that's a sure hand. Let's get into another wide receiver. And that other wide receiver is Keith Corbin. And we just talked about him and what he brought to Jackson State that's missing, the over the field. So we have kind of a, a somewhat of a understanding of what he'll be bringing to the table. And that is a guy who can go over the middle. But one thing I didn't talk about was the fact that he's a run and catch guy. Well, excuse me, run after the catch guy. I love a run after the catch guy. That's my favorite type of receiver. And I love that receiver because it means I can just get you the ball and let you make something happen. I don't always have to draw up a play for you to get somewhere. I can just get the ball in space. If I draw room for you to run after the catch, you'll do something. And Next Gen Stats has one of my favorite stats, and it's expected yards after the catch. They do that, and next to it, they have a plus or minus. So if you have more on average than you're supposed to, then it's going to be plus whatever. It's a plus 1.4. But if you have less, it's going to be minus 1.4. That's what it's going to show you as far as, man, this guy is really good. If he has 1.4 plus, he's really good after the catch. Um, You weren't supposed to get that much. You supposed to only get five yards of yards after the catch. But you end up getting eight. You end up getting ten. Things like that, you know? So... I love running after the catch receivers. And he was fifth in the SWAC in receiving. He was a second team all SWAC player. He's a really good player and somebody that I feel like isn't being talked about a lot. And I think he should. I think he should be mentioned, especially because there's not a lot of wide receivers that just jump to mind as far as HBCU players. I think he should be one of the people that you discuss more and more as the draft gets closer. And then lastly, we're going to go with a guy who I think breaks down the, the hoary idea of what a position is supposed to be. You see, no, we're going positionless. And the NFL has moved more and more to positionless ball, but not in this way. And that's Ladarius Skelton out of Southern. And it's kind of like Taysom Hill. I think he's going to be a trailblazer. I really do. I think he's going to be the first of many of his kind. And whether people are going to give him credit for being the trailblazer or not, I do think that Ladarius Skelton, at least in my mind, I can't think of it off the top of my head, He's going to be the first guy who comes in and promotes and brands himself as a Swiss Army knife, as a joker. I don't know. why I can't think of what position Saints fans always say Taysom Hill plays as far as when you just combine them all into one. For some reason, I want to say it's joker. I don't know. But the Swiss Army knife package, you're not going to be defined by a pass, by a position. Not if you're Ladarius Skelton. And he saw how Hill said, okay, more than just a quarterback, I can be a running back. I can be a tight end. I can be a slot receiver. He saw those things and said, that prolonged his career. Cause let's not get it twisted. I don't think Taysom Hill's still in the league if he's only a quarterback. And that's like, that's no slight to him. I mean, if anything, it's a credit to how smart he was and be able to swallow his pride. He could be Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow refused that same opportunity. And then look where he ended up. Taysom Hill took that opportunity and he's flourishing, making $10 million a year, being a Swiss army knife, being a gadget player, being a, being a joker. And Skelton has shown that he can play wide receiver. I've seen him running routes and doing things of that nature at the HBCU Combine. He's shown that he can be a running back as far as at the Legacy Bowl. And then he's also been a quarterback when he needs to, if he needs to drop back. Hey, man, have him as a, I don't know, a, a, a slot or a tight end, one of those like little flex tight ends, and then have him be your emergency quarterback at the same time. There's less position you have to spend on quarterback. But he's shown that and the ability to run so whether you need to see it in the Legacy Bowl or if you need to see it in just any other game, Ladarius Skelton can definitely run the ball. But I love it. I'm not, I'm not just going to be a quarterback. I'm going to be everything, and it makes him more valuable the same way that it made Taysom Hill more valuable. And I think you'll see a lot more people come in and say, like in high school when you're just an athlete, when you have the position of athlete in recruiting, that's what this is as far as the draft. I think you'll see more people come in with that mindset, and I hope people do because, hey, man, everybody's not going to be a quarterback. But if you can be an athlete, oh, let's do it. I'm with it. And I don't mean just change your position. I mean be a versatile, multi-positional player. 
that's what I think Ladarius Skelton is going to be the first of his kind as far as players who come out and are planning to do that, not players who just end up like that. It's a little bit of a difference. But we're going to continue tomorrow breaking down the draft, getting closer and closer. I have a really fun, a really fun show drawn up for you tomorrow. So make sure that you're making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And for your second listen of the day, check out Eric Crocker, former NFL and AFL cornerback. And Ryan Tracy giving you everything that you need for the NFL draft. It's only a couple of days away, like I say. So if you're looking for me in the meantime, in between time, you can catch me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.